something that he was not naturally. In other words, in Jesus' sinless divine nature, God put him into the body of a sinful woman. And he came into this world the same way that each of us is. That's why you and I can identify with him. Because he hasn't gone through anything that you and I haven't gone through. I love 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. All who are in Christ, verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 5, are new what? Creations. Creations. And have been given the what? Creative word of reconciliation. So that they now become what? Ambassadors for Christ. That's the word, we're, that's the first word we're exploring here. Or apostles, if you prefer that. Okay. The second word is found in verse 3 of Galatians 1. Grace be to you. I am amazed at the usages of the word grace. It is incredible. God never uses empty, politically correct, complimentary greetings. God's word creates. Where did we learn that? Genesis 1, verse 14. And God said what? Let there be light. And what happened? There was light. How many of you are familiar with Psalms 33, verses 6 and 9? By the word of the Lord were the heavens made by the what? By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. And all the host of them, by the what? The breath of his mouth. For he spake, boom, and it was complete. He commanded, and boom, it was done. God said through his ambassador Paul, apostle, in Galatians chapter 1 verse 3, Grace be to you, and what? So it is, if you believe it. This grace, however, can only be found in one place. In Christ Jesus. Let's confirm that. Who would like to volunteer to read 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. We are now exploring the second key word in the first five verses of Galatians chapter 1. The first word was apostle or ambassador. The second word is grace. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.1. Who would like to read that for us? Okay, listen. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that it is in Jesus Christ. Thank you. The biblical definition of the word grace, and I'm going to give you the number so you can look it up in your concordance at home if you have a strong analytical concordance, is the divine influence upon the heart and then the reflection in the life of that person. So it's a two-part definition. Look it up when you get home. It's uh, number uh, 5485 in your concordance, New Testament. Strong's Analytical Concordance. The divine influence upon the human heart and then the reflection in that heart, coming from that heart. Let's confirm that definition. Who would like to volunteer to read for us 2 Peter chapter 1? 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Volunteer? Carl? Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the 
knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Thank you. What does all things include? All things. Everything in life. You mean, little old me can experience all of this power? Yeah, if you're accessing and believe in God's creative power. Someone said, well, Chuck, I'm not there yet. Should I quit coming to Sabbath school until I'm there? And I said, no, it's the other way around. You keep coming to Sabbath school until you get it. And then you will start reflecting. Then you will become what? Ambassador. Ambassador sin. But it has to begin here. So the whole universe is given unto us. All the fullness and the power is whose? Ours. For what? The overcoming of sin. Living the Christian life. Let's confirm that. Let's go to Romans 6. I will read this passage. Romans 6. When you're there, say ready, and I'll give you the scripture. Ready? Here we go. Romans 6, verse 10 and 11. For the death that Jesus died, he died to sin. The word sin here is not a verb. It is being used as an adjective, speaking of my condition. My condition that I inherited from my great-grandparents out of an Eden. Okay? It's very important that we understand some of these words again. The word sin is used in the Bible several ways. Here it's being used as an adjective, sometimes as a noun. Sometimes the word sin is used as a verb. So you, he, you either can determine it from the context, or you have to look it up in your concordance. Or you have no clue what you're reading. Here we go, again. Verse 10, Romans 6. For the death that he died, he died to the sin problem. For how many people? All. Oh. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Now, verse 11. Even so, consider yourselves dead to what? Sin. To the condition. Why? Because he already died to the condition. And he qualified to die to the condition by taking on our nature at the incarnation. So everything that he did, he did for whom? For us. Us. The question is, do I believe it or not? I believe. Think, I believe. That's what they said when they really believed. <laughs> Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to the sin problem. Does it end there? No, but alive to, Christ, to God, where? In Christ Jesus. And that, folks, is the formula, God's formula, for living the Christian life. Amen. Now, how is this grace given? Does this grace, if, if, if everything, as we read earlier, includes everything in life, does that include God's agape love? Yes. Yeah. Yes? How many mothers do we have here this morning? How many of you had one child? How many of you had two children? How many of you had three children? Okay. As mothers of more than one child, did you, let's say you had two children, did you allocate your love to that child half to one and half to the other? Or if you had five, did you give one-fifth to one and on? Or did you what? They got 100% of your love. Now, if we human beings are capable of that, how much more is God capable of? In loving the human race. Who would like to read Isaiah 49, 15 for us? Isaiah 49, 15. Volunteer? Okay, Mary Jane. 
Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. Isn't that beautiful? So God had been trying to convey this concept to us since the Old Testament. Okay, closely after the second word, grace be to you and peace. That's our third word that we're exploring this morning. Peace from God. It may be of interest to you to know how the word peace is spelled in the original language of the New Testament. Are you ready? I-R-E-N-E. R-I-I-N-E. What does that sound like? Irene. Irene. Yeah. Some parents name their daughters Irene. Do you know what the word Irene means in the Greek language? Watch this. Watch it. Set at one again. Set at one again. What happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve decided to become self-dependent instead of God-dependent? They alienated themselves from God. Jesus coming to this world while I was helpless, ungodly, sinner, and his declared enemy, set me at one again with God. Forever. Amen. Again, we're going to support what we say from Scripture. So let's go to Romans 5, 18. And see how Jesus set us, or irene us, at one again with God. Romans 5.18. Who would like to read that first? Ricky? Therefore, <coughs> as though one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. The word justification that he just read, the last part of the verse, is a very important word. It's only used twice in the New Testament. The first time is in Romans 4.25, the last verse in Romans 4. The second time is right here, Romans 5.18. The Greek word is dikaiosis, which means acquittal. Jesus has acquitted you. Did he ask you for your permission to be a witness? No. <laughs> That's what the word means. We're talking grammar here. Dikaiosis. Jesus has acquitted the entire human race. Does that mean everyone's going to be saved? Like some mental pygmies that call themselves theologians teach? No. That's not what the Apostle Paul is talking about there. He's saying that by one act of unrighteousness, Condemnation came upon how many people? Oh. And by one act of righteousness, justification of life came to how many people? Oh. That's not talking about who's going to be in heaven. It's talking about the fact that you have been reconciled. You have been acquitted of everything that you have ever done in the past. If you believe. No. I'm sorry. You have nothing to do with this. We have nothing to do with this. This is talking about something that Jesus did while I was, Romans 5, 6, helpless and ungodly. Romans 5, 8, sinner. And Romans 5, 10, is declared in. It's a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift. Free gift. It is an absolute gift. We were, Paul talks we were about. acquitted after the first sin immediately. If, if we accept and have forgiveness. No. I'm sorry. We're talking grammar here. The word, there's three... There's nine words, usages of the word justification and righteousness in the New Testament. They fall into three categories. The first category is this one right here. Look it up in your, in your concordance. I'll give you the number, 1347. Strong's Analytical Concordance. Number 1347. Dikaiosis. An act of acquittal. Had nothing to do with you or whether you accept it or not. That's why I say it has nothing to do with who's going to be saved. Right, but the forgiveness was there immediately after Adam and Eve committed the sin. The forgiveness was there. By promise it was there, because the lamb was slain from the what? Revelation 13.8. But it was not confirmed and established until Jesus paid the price. Why? 
Because the sacrifice of animals, what can the sacrifice of animals do? The blood of animals do? Nothing. Hebrews 10, verse 1. Can I do anything for you? It was a God's show and tell way of showing us how much he abhors sin. And then when Jesus came, he confirmed it by his blood. All right. The fourth word that we're looking at is the word gave. Who would like to read Galatians chapter 1, verse 4? We need to move quickly here because I'm running out of time. Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. Thank you. The word gave means only one thing, folks. He bought us. He paid the price. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, You have been bought with a price. You no longer belong to yourself. I'm not going to be able to read these scriptures. You can look them up later on because I'm running out of time. So, it is true whether you believe it or not. And that's where the belief comes in. If you believe it, then it becomes a reality in your life. That you have been bought. Every bond that prevents us, or prevented us, from serving God, has been broken. I'll give you another scripture that you can look up later on. Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. Now we come to the fifth word. I'm sorry, but I want to finish this, because this establishes everything else that we're going to study for the next 12 weeks. If we understand the meaning of these seven words. The fifth key word is deliverance. Deliverance, folks, is ours. And that's why the Apostle Paul says in Romans 7, 24 and 25, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And he answers his own question in verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ, Amen. our Lord. When we choose to believe these biblical truths, we immediately experience the victory that has overcome the world. This one we have to read. Volunteer to read 1 John 5 verse 4. 1 John chapter 5 verse 4. We have to read this one. Quickly, would someone volunteer to read 1 John chapter 5 verse 4? Tom. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Thank you. Amen. Our faith or our faith in Jesus' faith? Yes. Which is it? Our faith. That's why each one of us has been given a measure of what? Faith. Romans 12, 3. So that we can then what? Dial whose faith? Jesus. And how quickly is that request answered? Immediately. Immediately. Okay. So all deliverance is according to the will of God and our Father. Which brings us to our sixth word, which is W-I-L-L. Will. This thing that we have up here is a decision making has a decision making capacity that determines everything that we do in life. The word will in the original language is speaking of determination or if you prefer a choice. You and I have a capacity of making a determination or a choice every time that we deal with a decision, an experience or a temptation. We have a choice to make and there is no more dramatic an illustration of that as we find in Matthew 26 39 Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane and he says to God in verse 39 if there's any way possible get me out of this why did he do that? Get me out of this. 
Or did he remember Revelation 13, 8, that he had volunteered in heaven? Yes. To what? To be the Lamb of God in case man disobeyed? Did he know that? Yes. In Matthew uh, 26, verse 2, he says to the disciples, Okay, let's go to Jerusalem. I am going to be sacrificed. So he knew what was happening. So why does he say in Matthew 26, 39, if there's any way possible, get me out of this. Nevertheless, not mine, but thy will be done. And that is the issue for each one of us. Are we going to push the enter button that says thy will? Every time we're faced with a decision, an experience, or temptation. That's our choice. Linda. It was his human weakness that wanted out. That was his human nature. It was to show his human nature that God could have a human nature while he was here. Because a lot of people don't believe that God can actually be human and not accept any of the divine power unless he asks for it and asks for the Holy Spirit in the healing that he did here. Excellent thought. Excellent thought. And that's what life on planet Earth is all about. Is it possible for a member of the human race, sinner, like me, is it possible for me to gain the victory over sin as Jesus gained the victory? Absolutely. 100%. What does Jesus tell me in Revelation 3.21? Chuck, I want for you to what? Overcome. The same way that I am. In other words, in the equipment that I took on ethically and legally in order to save you, I want now for you to what? Use the same recipe, which is what? Turning every decision, experience, and temptation over to his heavenly father and continuously allowing himself to be led by the Holy Spirit for 33 and a half years. That is the best recipe for victorious Christian living. That is, if you believe the definition of the words that we're studying here this morning. Isn't it all based on that one word, believe? It is. So, you know, I've heard it said that belief stands for because Emmanuel lives, I expect victory every time. Okay. But, you know, that's... Uh, all right. But that's the concept. The issue is faith. What does Jesus tell us in the parable in Luke 18, 8? When the Son of Man comes back to this earth, will he find what? Commandment keepers? <laughs> Vegetarians? Faith. What does it say? Faith. Faith. Faith, faith. faith in what? Your hard-earned faith that you ground away your entire life? No. no. Faith in His faith. Amen. You dialed His faith and boom, it was there. And you gained the same victory, guaranteed, as He experienced when He was here on this earth. What is God's will for each one of us? First Thessalonians 4.3 Sanctification is God's will for each one of us. Now, what does that word sanctification mean? It's a fancy word for Christian living. That's all it is. Sanctification. The last key word is the word found in the last verse that we're reading and studying this morning. Galatians 1, no, verse 5. Who would like to read Galatians 1, verse 5 for us, please? To whom be glory forever and ever. <clears throat> that word glory has two meanings in the Bible. To give God glory doesn't mean that we are doing something for God. That's misunderstood by a lot of people. I think it means to reflect His glory to others. Isn't it the worship? I'm sorry? Isn't that a form of worship? It is a form of worship. It is a form of worship. But what does the word glory mean? First of all, remember verse uh, John 1, 14? John 1, 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his what? Glory. Glory. Again, glory is the only what? God and the Father. Full of what? Grace and truth. Grace and truth. So it is reflecting God. That's what the word glory means. And it also recognizes what? The creative power of God's word in reproducing his character in each one of us. 
That is the purpose of the word glory. And we experience that by understanding the meaning of these seven words that we have been exploring this morning. At this point. When we choose to be reconciled to God, as the Apostle Paul begs us in 2 Corinthians 5, 20, then the creative power of God in His words that we have studied today becomes a reality in our lives, in our individual lives, including God reproducing His character in us. Because that makes our lives, the glory of God in us, reproducing His character, makes what we say credible. Where someone can say, this really works. This is the real deal. The only way that the third angel's message, the everlasting gospel, can turn the world upside down is by the power of the latter rain which is yet to have been poured out. The letter to the Galatians assigns God glory. Just read it. Verse 5, Galatians 1. Revelation 14, 7 says, Revere God. Revere, your Bible says fear God. But the word is revere. Revere God. And give what? Glory. glory to Him. How do we get glory? Like this brother just said by here, back here. By reflecting what we have allowed God to do in us, which is what? Reproducing His character in us. Worshiping, worshiping in truth and spirit. So, we revere God and give Him glory. And until we do, the latter rain cannot be poured up. The book of Galatians is a last day message because it's describing the relationship that a generation of people must experience in their lives before the latter rain can be poured out. I am skipping quite a bit here because I'm running out of time. Is it 1044? Six minutes. Okay. If we study the scriptures with an attitude to learn what words mean, what is God trying to communicate to us? And then with the heart, by faith, we respond to what the Holy Spirit's begging us to do. If we respond to that begging, prompting, then you become an ambassador for God. You're qualified that moment. God does the rest. Then and only then can Revelation 18, 1 to 4, be fulfilled. Which is the passage that says, A fourth angel came down from heaven. We're familiar with three angels, but there is a fourth angel that has to come down. And he cannot and will not come down until there's a people that understand the meaning of these seven words that we have explored very briefly this morning and are allowing it to become a reality in their lives. And it is my prayer that that is the choice that each of you will make. To be reconciled to God's begging you to be reconciled to Him. And be that generation that will bring an end to life as we know it today on this earth. What an incredible honor and privilege to be that generation that says it stops right here because I accept being sent the apostleship or the ambassadorship that God wants for me to experience in my life and proclaim it in my life. We have four minutes. Any questions on what we've covered? Jim. Did God, did Christ have to die on the cross for us to be saved? Well, Leviticus 17, 11 says what? Without the shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no what? Remission of sin. Okay. What does Hebrews 10, 1 say? Okay. 
One other question. No, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. What does Hebrews 10 verse 1 say? For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, but not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continuously make the comers thereunto unto what? Qualify. Could Christ have failed and not been and and, and not been uh, executed on the cross? Could he have failed? Yes. yes. Okay. You always had that.